Our final chapter is the untouchables. And this is clear on the other end of the scale. Uh, these are plants that you can just, you just barely touch them. A few crossing rubbing branches, some tiny thinning cuts before you get into trouble. So they're not actually untouchables. They're touch lightlies, I guess you'd call them. I'm not saying that you can never prune them. You can certainly always take out the dead wood, and you should. And you can take out some of the most annoying branches that maybe hit you in the face or run along the ground or muck up the good looks of your branch structure. Uh, but you can't do very much with these because if you do, you get water sprouts. And these are the ones that we're going to go over specifically. That would be witch hazel, double file viburnums, and winter hazels. But uh, there are other whole other category of shrubs that water sprout like crazy if you just look at them cross-eyed. Ah, we should replace this with the following. This is a um, water sprouting tree that has been over pruned. This is what I mean by water sprouts on trees that have been topped. And there's a whole series of trees that should pr be pruned very lightly. That would be dogwoods, magnolias, crab apples, cherries, purple leaf plums. So here's an untouchable or a touch lightly. This is a witch hazel. It's a very special plant. It has a sort of spider-like, a sweet-smelling uh, yellow flower in the winter. It also turns pretty colors in the fall. And you can have a tree or a tree-like shrub, a witch hazel that looks like this, quite lovely. Looks like this in the winter, pretty dang cool. It's that fabulous branch structure that we like on this plant that means you can't reduce the height or the width. If you cut this down to make it short or in to make it narrow, it will just turn into a mess of water sprouts and ruin the whole schmear, which is why you have to very carefully place things. In the middle of this slide, off to the right, is a witch hazel. And I spent a good 45 minutes trying to figure out where to put this plant in this lady's yard because it has to have all the room that it will need to get as tall as it wants to be and as wide as it wants to be because it is not very prunable for these things. But you wanted to be able to see it from the window because, you know, it's going to be cold and rainy and nasty out there when it's in bloom. So you have to put it in the bed, go back and look at it from the window and ask yourself, run it through time in your mind's eye, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Is it poking people in the eye? Is it interfering with people in the pathway? Because they get this big and bigger. Behind this person is a witch hazel, and that's not even a really big one. So this is what you have to imagine in your head when you're planting them. And just know that you can't prune for size control. Double file viburnum is under the same category of these shrubs that have this wonderful angular branch structure, this horizontal branch structure. And it also will defy size reduction, both height and width. And they get big. Please note how large this shrub is. Everything gets bigger than you think it's going to. This is a very well-sighted plant. It's far away from the walkway. It's still got room to go before it gets even up to the windows. And it has these double ranks of creamy white flowers in the spring. Here's one at a customer's yard. And it was planted too close to the entryway. And so we actually limbed it up a little bit so that you could get by it. But because you're limbing it up on one side means you can't limb it up or prune it elsewhere because that would exceed the pruning budget. And just to see how really huge this plant gets and how very nice it is with those creamy double-ranked flowers. Here they are in rows of two. And they sort of sit up above the branch, double file. That's why they call it the double file viburnum. 
and it turns really nice colors in the fall. Isn't that nice? It is of a number of plants with this horizontal branch structure, uh, which include the witch hazel and the winter hazel and the winter sweet. All of them have this horizontal branch structure, which you do not want to screw up by uh, heading it or even selectively heading it. Uh, and you don't even want to thin it too much because it water sprouts. And uh, the hazelnut, the corollus, as opposed to the corolopsis, or filbert, also water sprouts like crazy. So you cannot thin it very much and you cannot reduce the size very much. Some people want to treat it like a cane grower, but you will get straight shoots coming up from the base. So the trick to these is just don't prune them very much, and then you won't get the water sprout nightmare. And just to confuse you, there's a corydalis too. It's a ground cover. It has nothing to do with pruning. But, you know, you got your corolopsis, your corolis, and your corydalis. Don't you just love Latin? Corylopsis is the winter hazel, also a cool plant. Has these kind of yellow, waxy dingle dangles. That's another horticultural term from the offices of plant amnesty. In the winter, we give plants extra special credit if they do anything in the winter months when we're starved for color and flowers. Here's one. It sort of looks like it's hung in earrings. And uh, notice the horizontal branch structure of this again, much like the witch hazel. And you don't want to screw that up by trying to reduce it or even thinning it out too much. Uh, and it also has a nice fall color. I guess the only thing I might do with this one is get it up off the ground just a tiny bit. So the thing for the touch lightlies, or as I call them, the untouchables is to use many smaller cuts. They're all true thinning cuts, and you get a little bit more, you get to prune a little bit more if you do it in the summer. Summer has a sort of a less stimulating effect on the water sprout production. So let's say this is your witch hazel, and you want to walk by it, and you can't walk by it, so you just non-selectively head back a couple of branches shown in black here. That's where you cut them. This is what it will do next year. That's no good. Uh, so this is a, another one that you have. We're taking it back. And I have decided that it's too tall. So I'm going to attempt to make it shorter using a selective heading cut. And these are the cuts I have decided to make in hopes that it will make my shrub shorter. One is a non-selective heading cut, and the other one is a selective heading or reduction cut. Hey, and it looks pretty good when I'm done. I like how it looks. But this is what it will do next year. And if I cut those off, more come back. If I cut those off, more and more come back. If I cut those off, more and more and more come back. This is why we want to avoid the size reduction. Okay, I've decided this is the same plant, but I've decided I want to make it look very open and exotic. So I'm going to thin out a whole bunch of these branches and these are the ones I have chosen shown in black. Oh no, look what happens. Even though I used real thinning cuts, because we are in the category of the untouchables or the touch lightlies, it doesn't take much before I get into a nightmare of water sprouts again. So you do not want to do this thing. Well, here's an example of I have just decided to take out some of the smaller branches and just very gently thin it. They're shown in black. You may or may not be able to see them. And this is what it looks like when I'm done. It's a little bit cleaner and open. But because I was gentle and I didn't do too big a cuts or too many cuts, this is what it looks like next year. It hasn't water sprouted back. It stayed pretty much done. Hallelujah. So. The trick is to prune lightly, making relatively small cuts. Uh, here's an example of a side branch, which is in the way of the walkway. And I need to take it off so people can get by. But I, because I have a limited pruning budget, I'm just going to make this one rather large thinning cut and leave everything else alone, lest I scare it into a spasm of regrowth. But because I pruned, I didn't do too much. I only did the one cut. 
uh, and I did it in the summer. This is what it looks like when I'm done. And this is what it looks like next year. And here's a slide that has absolutely nothing to do with pruning. It's a slide of where our tree roots really are. Everybody has the wrong picture in their head of where the tree's roots are. They think it's kind of like the one on the left where the bottom mirrors the top. The tree roots mirror the crown of the tree. They only go out to the drip line and they go about as deep as the tree is tall. This is a fictitious tree. This tree does not exist in nature. This tree exists only on labels and in storybooks. It's everywhere in print. It does not exist in nature. The real tree's roots look like the one on the right. There are some tap roots, but they don't really go as deep as you think. Most of the roots are in the top three feet of the soil, and most of the absorbing roots are in the top three inches. And what difference does this make is that we inadvertently are killing our trees all the time because we have the wrong picture in our heads. The guy on that backhoe, he has the wrong picture in his head of where the tree roots are, and he's about to dig out some holes and um, dig into the major root system of the tree. If most of the tree roots go deep, nothing you do on the top does much damage. But since the tree roots are on the surface, just driving over the roots of your tree over and over can slowly kill it. And it sometimes takes five to seven years for a tree to start dying back from construction damage. And by construction damage, I mean something as simple as parking your cars under the tree or storing your uh, lumber under a tree or putting a patio around your tree or rototilling up the yard to make a vegetable patch. If you are affecting more than a third of the roots of the tree, your tree could be in deep trouble. And the closer you get to the trunk, the more roots you are severing. When you get in the drip line and you're trenching to put in, say, utilities, by the time you get in the drip line, you start to tunnel under the roots. You don't cut through them, you go under them. And I just wanted you to know so that you wouldn't inadvertently kill your tree. And I'm not the only one who wants you to know. The grantors who made this slideshow possible, that would be the Washington State Department of Natural Resources, Urban and Community Forestry Division, who are spending the money given to them by the USDA Forest Service. They want you to know where the tree's roots are, and they want you to know not to top trees and not to tip trees and not to strip trees and to be good to your trees because they are long-term investment in your community and for the ecology. And the USDA Forest Service also wanted me to mention that they are an equal opportunity employer. So thank you to our grantors. If bad pruning and inadvertent tree damage drives you crazy, I want you to know that your support group has arrived. It's called Plant Amnesty. Our mission is to end the senseless torture and mutilation of trees and shrubs caused by malpruning. Come visit us on our website. You can download more PowerPoint slideshows on pruning. There's also a book that you get if you join. And interesting and exciting news, you can join Plant Amnesty and become part of the campaign to end bad pruning. And I want to thank you very much for watching this slideshow. Go out and sin no more.